What's up, everybody? This is Rabbit and Blue Radio with the Skeleton Crew. This is Alex. Michael J. And our special guest host. Dan J. We've, uh, I, I know what you're thinking. Uh, we kind of remember that show. They've been gone for a while. Well, you know, things are a little different. We're a little restructured now. And we're going to get into all that later. But right now, we got a special for you. We are doing the 12 days of Friday the 13th. We're going to break down dissect and everything in between all 12 Friday the 13th movies leading up to Friday the 13th this April which is the first Friday the 13th of the year and uh, you're going to have a good time we're all going to have a good time right guys? Very excited. I am very excited I am thrilled I'm, I'm pitching a 10 over it but <laughs> I, I'm ready to puke Well obviously let's just you know get a little intro of the movie um, basically Halloween got everything going uh, Friday 13, Sean Cunningham, he saw the popularity of Halloween. Victor uh, Miller decided to write a screenplay basically ripping off Halloween. But you know what? There's enough differences where basically all they did was take the holiday type of theme. Halloween is very subtle and suggestive. And uh, Friday 13 is more like visceral and brutal. So I think I think they're two different movies. What do you think, Mike? I would totally agree with you. I mean, they are, because you got babysitters in Halloween, and these are camp counselors on Crystal Lake, so... Yeah. That's and, different. And you know what? Halloween borrowed from Black Christmas and Psycho, and, and nobody seems to bash that for that, do they? No. no. What do you think, Dan? I mean, uh, do, do you well, feel Friday 13th is different enough from Halloween where it's its own entity? Well, it definitely is, and I think it set out to be that originally. It, it tried to, uh, you know, copy Halloween and what, and what Halloween did right, but it turned into something different. You know, everybody loves the atmosphere, of course. Everybody knows that. You know, the music is amazing. You know, I want to get into, like, the actual movie, though. Steve Christie owns Camp Crystal Lake, and he's reopening it. He invested $25,000 into it, and uh, it starts off, you know, you see him in Alice, Mike, what do you think the relationship was between Alice and Steve Christie? I mean, the dude looks like a child molester uh, with those with those cut off <laughs> shorts, glasses, the, the long curly hair, that mustache, and uh, you know, Alice says, "I'm going to go back to California to straighten some things right. out." You know, but she had to live near there, otherwise, how would he have hired her from California? I mean, what do you what do you think the relationship was prior to this movie? Well, I read the the novelization of it, you know, the book. And I don't want to try to get too technical here, but in the book, they kind of, she's known him, I guess, like they've had um, trysts, I guess, like romantic things in the past. And it kind of like expands on the fact that, yeah, she does have a boyfriend and she's kind of like can't decide who to be with. Really? Yeah. You know what it is, though? She's cheating on her boyfriend out in California with Steve Christie. Yes, and can I just and, mention in that scene, which has bothered me for so long, and I've been dying to bring this up with somebody, <laughs> and I'm glad I can do it now. When she's having that conversation with him, mm-hmm. she's moving the ladder. If you look at what, how far she actually moves the ladder or <laughs> how little she moves it, she probably moves it about an inch. <laughs> <laughs> well, she had to get, I, I, I never <laughs> understood it. I just had to get that out. Sorry, well, she, gentlemen. She, she had to get that other nail in there, huh? Yeah. Right. It's very yeah. important. Well, you I know, just didn't buy it. <laughs> you know what though? He kind of calls her out though because he's like, "Come on, stay a week. Get you know, help get the place ready. If if you want to go by next Friday, I'll put you on the bus myself." So so obviously he didn't feel that what she was going back to was important enough. I, maybe that was his way of saying, you know, don't choose this guy over me. Just you know, blow him off and stuff. That's exactly exactly, Alex. Exactly, yeah. All right. Well, in this movie, it's a it's a whodunit movie, and basically, the audience is supposed to observe the behavior of all the characters. One that comes to mind is Bill. Remember, he kills the snake, then he holds the blade up, and he, like, glares down at it like a killer? 
Mm-hmm. And yep. then, then you got Steve Christie driving around in a green Jeep, and of course Annie gets in a green Jeep in the beginning of the movie, then jumps out and then gets her throat cut. So clearly the red herrings are Steve Christie and Bill. Did you right. guys, when you first watched this, were you already like tainted? You already knew who the killer was? No, I, I definitely didn't. When I first saw it, um, I was totally surprised. You know, House of Horror, the other uh, radio show on this site, Joe, the host there, and they do a great job. They really know how to break down movies. They're a, yes, they they're, do. They're a, a great show. And I believe he's the one who said that at the climactic ending where Mrs. Voorhees is revealed as the killer, it was a total cop-out. He said the reason why is because she's not in the movie and, like, we're supposed to be observing all these people's behavior and trying to, you know, do with a process of elimination who might be the killer because this person wasn't here when this person was killed, blah, blah. And then at the end of it, when you th- when you think you might have figured out it's Steve Christie or someone, blah, 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 all of a sudden just somebody out of nowhere comes into the movie and just says, hi, I'm the killer. And it's like, what kind of whodunit movie was that? Like, what- Well, she doesn't really say, hi, I'm the killer <laughs> in her defense. <laughs> When she pulls up, yeah, I understand that, you know, you put uh, one and one together and you realize, okay, she's the killer. But literally, she doesn't go to her and say, you know, she's the killer. There's a nice little cat and mouse game there that I love. I mean, that that whole point, you know, the whole point in the movie when she drives up and there's a whole back and forth with her on and Alice is just amazing to me. Dan, when when Alice was talking to, to Miss Voorhees and out of nowhere, she's like, my little boy, do you know that he he drowned? They were making love with that young boy. Were we like, okay, this is the killer. This lady's nuts. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'll be honest with you. She creeped me out as soon as she stepped out of that Jeep with that with that wide grin. But it did throw me off a little bit. But, you know, I don't think it was necessarily, quote-unquote, like you said, a cop-out. I think maybe it was prob- most likely intentional because if you're going to put in – red herrings and go through all this trouble to do these type of things and, and throw everybody off like that, I, I that's original to me, you know? You're expecting one thing, you get another, you know? And right. maybe that was intentional, and maybe it wasn't. But I, I don't think, you know, we'll have to uh, ask Victor Miller on that one. Yeah. You know, a lot in, in this whole series we're going to do, I want to do the what-the-F moments of Friday the 13th, like... When you watched it, like, what things were you like, what the hell is this, or what is going on? For me, I love when Alice discovered Ralph in the pantry. <laughs> like, <laughs> how long was Get he in there? <laughs> how, <laughs> how long was he in there? And, and how the hell did he get in there with no one noticing? And how much time was he willing to dedicate to that, <laughs> that jump scare? <laughs> You know what it was? Can I can I just say what I think? Yeah. He hid behind a giant pot that they were going to cook hamburger soup in or something. <laughs> what? And he just stood there. <laughs> I'm yeah, not kidding. Fact, I think Mike, that that's the case. Is this my IMDb? No, this is this is just my that's my thought of it. Wait, but I, I, I think don't that's what happened. What is your thought? How does your thought make it seem any more sane? It's not sane. It's totally insane, and that that just shows the craziness of the character. Oh, I thought you were saying, oh, well, you don't understand. He was just hiding behind a big pot. <laughs> yeah, well, no, he hid behind a big pot because he's, he's, he's a nut job. Right. I think, I think you lost me, Mike. Maybe. I, <laughs> I do that with a lot of people, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, the hottest girls in the movie, what, what do you think? Oh. Uh, oh. That's a tough one. I think it's easy. I think it's very easy. I'm going to go with uh, both Marcy and Brenda are hot. Ooh, well. You know, re- re- rest in peace, of course, Brenda. Oh, well, right, yeah, right. That, that's. Yeah, see, I'd go with Brenda, too, to be honest with you. Yeah, she was pretty that's hot. That's my style. Yeah, and too bad that damn um, door blew I'm open. all Marcy. I am definitely Marcy. Yeah. Especially see, in the, in the unrated too? cut. In that movie, though, you know, a lot of those girls had an innocence to them, too. And, right. you know, it, they weren't over the top yet. And that's what, that's why it's so diluted these days. You don't care about them. They're just, you know, unfortunately, they're just bimbos. And, uh, <laughs> and they don't add anything. You don't care about them. And these girls, you know, you, you felt like they were camp counselors. They, you know, there's an innocence to the whole crew in general. But those girls seem very vulnerable. So when they did get picked off, it was, um, you know, it was that much more effective. Yeah. You know, I just want to say that uh, 
I really did love the sex scene that you were talking about that she was in, but I did not need to see Kevin Bacon's ass. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, and, but you know what? You wouldn't. Have, you only got to see his. I think his his ass, ass in the crack. unrated ass. cut. Oh, really? Well, I must have. Yeah, had that I don't one. even think. I don't even think you saw her breasts in the R-rated cut. I think that's only in the unrated cut as well. Mm, I think I. Well, well, he was holding them, right? Right, and then in the unrated cut, you actually see a glimpse of them oh, okay. of nipple and such. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of Kevin Bacon, I also didn't need to see his uh, exactly what his penis looked like in that tight blue bathing suit either. I don't know why we had to see a close-up of that before that belly flop on the way to save Ned. On a quick side note, in the movie Wild Things in 1998, you actually see his thinger. I was looking at the two girls, but I, I'm glad you noticed that, Mike. Well, no, a friend of mine who's <laughs> gay... Uh, Made me uh, do it like frame by frame just so you could see it. <laughs> oh my god, and I was just kidding oh, about that. Lord. Oh, yeah. I gave you more credit. <laughs> oh boy. Um, best couple in the movie. Easily, Marcy and Jack, right? Yep. No. Ooh. I, think, well, see, oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Alice and Mr. Steve Christie. No. Right. I'm going to see, I'm going to go against the dream couple, but I think that they became a couple closer to the end of the film. I want to go with Alice and Bill. Yes. I count them as a couple, especially in the third act of the film. And I think that they would have become a power couple had Bill not been killed. Uh, Can I change my couple? Okay. I I want to change mine, actually. Steve Christie and the... uh, that, that cute girl at the diner. Oh, yes. When she said, Oh, Sandy. Just, just, just a night Sandy. in the town. Sandy. 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 And he's a big tipper for, uh, for <laughs> that time, right. too. What did he do? 75 it was, cents? There. It was, well, wait, it was two and a quarter, <laughs> and he gave her $3. <laughs> so that's 75 cent tip. Now, how much and how much percentage of that from the bill? I have is no that? idea. I you can't know. figure out percentage. Yeah, we're guys, you're going to learn. We're three idiots. So we're just going to get the fun movie <laughs> stuff going in. Anytime we have to get numbers together. Yeah, forget it. Yeah. We're not here. Yeah, Sandy. <laughs> I do love Sandy. She's great. <laughs> okay. What do uh, I owe you, Sandy? Just a night on the town? He's like, <laughs> yeah, right. No, seriously, what do I owe you? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, what do I owe you? All right, just two and a quarter and that's it. Yeah. He's yeah. like, here you go, Sandy. Keep the change. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Keep the change, and I'll do the jokes around here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've actually, just a side note, I've actually eaten in that diner about five times now. Oh, that's right. really? You live near there, or you used yeah. to live near there. No, I still do. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's in Blairstown, New Jersey. Uh, nice. Was she there? Did you uh, at, the at, game? Sandy still works there. You're right. Wow. And I still gave her a 75-cent tip, but it was a, a $32 <laughs> meal. Wow. <laughs> nice. She probably, dude, next time you go there, you're going to get a loogie in your coffee. Yeah, she was like, she was like, what the hell is this? I said, no, it's, it, it, it's, it's like the movie, you know? And she's <laughs> like, this is the year 2003, asshole. Yeah, and you're not Steve Christie. Yeah, and she didn't get the joke, but that's fine. <laughs> you know, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, you know what I want to do? I want to play a little clip for everybody. A great yeah. a great little thing. Uh, Marcy, remember that cool little dream she had? Yeah, I've had this dream about five or six times where I'm in a thunderstorm. Mm-hmm. And it's raining really hard. It sounds like pebbles when it hits the ground. I can hear it. I try to block out the sound with my hands, only it doesn't work. It just keeps getting louder and louder. And the rain turns to blood. And the blood washes away in little rivers. And the sound stops. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was, that was a great clip. One of the best parts of the movie. Um, I loved it. And, you know, it makes it even more sad when she dies, but I, I, I must admit that Marcy's kill was easily the best one of the movie. Mm. Uh-oh. Mm-mm. Do off-screen kills count as best kills in the film? How could they, Mike? Because you still see the end result. <sighs> They're not effective, though. They to don't me, have they were budget. effective. Dude, when, when she found Bill staked to the door, that was effective, and I that remember was. seeing that when I was a child. And that, that haunted my dreams itself, for weeks though. was the result yeah. of the kill. Well, you're, you're correct, sir, but it wasn't technically a kill. Do you know what I mean? Okay, like, well, 
Well, then if I have to go with the kill itself... Oh, wait, so then I guess Brenda doesn't count either because you don't see her. Oh, my God, kill. Mike, what, are you afraid to look at these people die? No, it's just... It's really neat when you see, like, the reveals of their death. Like, when Brenda gets thrown through the window, even though it was really Tom Savini, but you you like to think that it's Brenda, I mean... You say it's that, neat. that scared me. Uh, well, you know what? I'm sorry, but the suspense leading up to Marcy, you know, she hears the noise. She's, you know, the, the axe buried in her face just looks so good. I, I don't okay. know. I love that. I got it, though. All right, but you're talking about the suspense building up. Okay, well, I'm talking about the suspense building up to the reveal of Bill's corpse. Uh, when she's walking and you hear the... Wait a minute. Okay. Dude, I got a gripe. What's that, right? that whole part leading up what? to Bill's death, that was the yeah, worst the part of the movie. You're insane. Dude, freaking, we're sitting there staring at Alice, sleeping, yeah. Yeah. Ma making tea, fiddling around with the guitar. I remember sitting there watching, and I'm like, did they just leave the camera on? Does anybody know they're filming a movie? It's I, atmosphere. Dude, I, I, I dude, saw... Dude, she's alone on the campsite. We know everybody else is dead or... Or lost or something. Listen, she doesn't. I'll tell you the truth. That's what, the beauty of it. It accentuated the fact that nothing happens, and literally, I cannot watch that without fast forwarding it. I cannot believe that you find that the best. Part. I'm on the edge of my seat the whole time. Oh my! <laughs> I'm dude. I'm on the edge of my seat. It scares me half to death because it's like, what's going to happen? She's walking around, and you hear all this music playing, and she's like, Bill, Bill. Bill, she's walking, and you don't know what's going to happen. Right. And then all of a sudden, it's like, winnie, 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 winnie. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, Adrian King's very, you're a very nice woman, but you are a part of the two most boring drag-on scenes in the history of cinema. You got, you got the one you're we just talked. You're a individual for thinking that. I can't believe. We that. just talked about one, and and the beginning of Friday Thirteenth Part Two, where we got to watch you putz around your apartment for twenty minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but look, if you want to do a cameo, just get in and out. Please. Yeah, that was a that scene in the beginning tracked oh. so much, oh my and God. You know, we'll talk about that in the next. Yeah, one. yeah, we'll talk about that. But I just wanted to throw it in on top of this one. You know, I but, disagree with I, it, so we'll get more into that later. Yeah, we'll just mute you, Mike. Oh no, one more what the f moment uh, when Enos mm -hmm. grabs Annie's ass while she's getting into. He the truck. was just helping her to up yes. into the truck. Mm -hmm. It's normal. It's natural. And if she was wearing a skirt, would he have done the same thing? Probably, and I would have said, bravo to you, sir. Would he put his hand up her skirt, or would he grab the back of it? I would have, and I would have said, bravo to me, then, too, sir. <laughs> <laughs> would you have smelled your fingers when you were finished? Of oh, course, God. that's the added benefit. <laughs> As you guys know, this movie is, like, riddled with bad writing. Like, things like when they're playing Monopoly, and Alice is like, Baltic Avenue, you owe me one boo, and Brenda's like, Alice draws first blood, and Bill goes, that's a terrible way to talk about my feet. Or the, like the bad jokes when they're swimming, and they're like, if you were a flavor of ice cream, what would it be? Rocky Road. Like, and then you got vitamin C supposed to neutralize the nitrite, and the freaking, why is there a snake in here? We are in the woods. We're not in the woods. Like, I don't know, man. This movie just had some really bad lines, but it had some good lines, too. Of One of my favorite quotes is from uh, Officer Dorf when he's like, sit on it, Tonto. Yes. Sit on it, Tonto. Yeah. Officer That's a great Dorf. one, dude. My, my favorite is, who are you people? <laughs> uh, well, we're just camp counselors. We're here to get the place ready. Ready for what? <laughs> That's like the best line. Ready for what? <laughs> yeah, right. And, you know, I, I always like to, like, dissect characters or, like, sit, you know, try to get into the psychological point And... With Mrs. Voorhees, I think, like, she has some anger management issues or, like, a chemical imbalance. And when her son died, it kind of pushed her over the edge. And and the the line where she's like, look what you've done to him. Look what you've done. You know, in my opinion, it's really her saying, uh, look what the neglect of Jason did to me. And in other words, they pushed her into being a raging psycho. I think she carries some guilt, even though the counselors were, you know, screwing each other and not watching him. I think she feels like she should have been there to save him. And I think uh, that psychological aspect is not in the later films. I think that's why this is such good writing. And as me and Mike, we talked about, it, it's kind of a reverse psycho type thing because Norman Bates would talk in his mother's voice and Mrs. Voorhees would talk in Jason's voice. Right, but you know what? I don't think 
that she had a chemical imbalance before this happened. I think before Jason drowned, she was okay. I mean, she might have been, you know, had a little, her little quirks and things like that. But she just hadn't killed anybody yet? <laughs> yeah, right. well, no, Mike, you can't go from a normal person to murdering. <laughs> well, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. But how can you? Seriously, how can you? Okay, if, if, if you had a kid and yeah. he drowned because yeah. two people were neglectful, would you, right. would no, you no, go no. to court or would you kill 20 people? Right, no, this is what I'm saying. Before Jason drowned, when Jason was alive, right. or, you know, before he supposedly drowned, he probably didn't really drown, but either way, she was fine. Then when he was neglected and he did drown, that's when she snapped. Before that, she was fine. If he would have gone on living his uh, mongoloid existence, she would have been okay. She would have been his caregiver throughout his life. Right. She wouldn't have killed anybody. I don't think a chemical imbalance was involved. I just think that she snapped. But don't you have to be a little loose to be able to snap like that? Well, I'm saying she was a little quirky, but I don't think that she was entirely loose. I mean, she had a psychotic break. So with that said, though, Mike, does that mean that applies to Jason as well? Because it's the exact same thing, like you said, Alex, not in the later films, but especially in 2 when, you know... um, it's it's basically shown that he's hearing voices or not voices, but um, Amy Steele dresses up as mother right. and confuses right. him, and and he's you know obviously doing this for his mother, and he, he's basically is so is that they're both psychotic, you know, like right. it, it's, right. it's 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 genes um, exactly. Well, no, 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 it's not even argument, genes. I guess, huh? It's, well, it's not even it's not even genes, really. It's it's the fact that Jason saw his mother get killed. So when Jason saw his mother die, something inside of him snapped. Well, yeah, you know, it is. hear the voices, though. You know, I like the the, the psychology in that because it showed how twisted, uh, like like mentally twisted Jason is. I mean, you you know, you could say, well, uh, he's he's doing nothing but uh, kill people, so we already know how twisty he is. But keep in mind how Mrs. Voorhees snapped at the end of the the original. So the psychology thing is to show us that Jason is just as attached to Miss Voorhees as she was to him. So they both have, like, they they have issues. Okay, Mike, if they're not chemically imbalanced, they have attachment problems. Oh, they totally do. I'm I'm not going to dispute that one way or another. I know they do. Right. Okay, well... One of the big things that this movie suffers from, in my opinion, is the rewritten ending. When what I mean by that is, it, they had the greatest ending. You know, you think the movie's over, and Jason jumps out of the water and gets Alice, pulls her in uh, the water, and then suddenly, that becomes a dream sequence. Now, before it became a dream sequence, it could raise a million questions, like, right. why would Jason's body just be in that lake for what? How many years? You know. Uh, 57 it's 80. an 80 yeah. Yeah. yeah so 57 to 80 so figure 57 to 77 is Go ahead. 20, 23 years you sure 23 <laughs> years just kidding yeah so so you would say why is his body in the in, in the lake for 23 years how did he come yeah. to life and like you know people who are really into crazy theories would be like oh he well, wasn't what? in the lake he didn't drown Right, well, when when Alice chopped the mother's head off, which, by the way, a machete would never make it through a neck and bone like that. So. You don't believe that? Oh, absolutely. Dude, a machete, and dude, a machete is pretty heavy-duty stuff. Oh, swung by a, a, a 19-year-old girl? She's strong. <laughs> a guy with hairy knuckles? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but anyway, some people would say when, when his mom's head got chopped off, her blood ran into the, the lake, which right. brought Jason back to life. Okay, oh, that's God. a little. <laughs> well, see, that's why I think they originally changed the um, the original ending, Alex, and made it a dream sequence because they wanted the shock. They they had a good idea, but they couldn't implement it in a way that made sense. And, and it made it, no that sense. would be an ultimate cop out to say, well, that doesn't make any sense, and that's why it was, you know, a dream sequence or whatever. So. Right. Well, he was born in like forty six. He was like about thirty three or thirty four years old by then. At that time, right. I actually talked to Ari Lehman, the guy who played the little boy Jason, and if anyone's curious, uh, I don't know if you ever even came up with this, I, I actually asked him, uh, what were you thinking when you were down there before you jumped up and got Alice? I was just wondering. You know, Did just, you remember? Yeah. It's the weirdest answer. <laughs> he said, 
Well, I was thinking of something to motivate me to be very angry and look like I was really going to murder this girl. And I, I wasn't in that headspace yet. And so what I did was I thought of the Holocaust and how the Jews were persecuted and Hitler. And Are I got, you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Oh, boy. And I'm thinking to myself... I think he's a little off. As I'm looking at him, I'm yeah. saying, you're telling me at 11 years old, this is the kind of stuff you thought about. And I didn't... I was just like, oh, cool, man. All right. <laughs> you know, because I wasn't going to sit there and say, I think you're nuts, uh, Harry. All right, guys. Well, I guess that's about it for this movie. We can't go too long. We have 12 more shows to do, which you guys will get every single day. Remember, tomorrow we have part two. Overall, guys, I'm going to rate this movie for what it is, of course, eight and a half to nine. That's Out of it. ten? Yeah. Okay. What do you wow. say, Dan? What do you think? Try the 13th original. I'd probably have to give it seven. Okay. I seven? give it a ten. Oh, I knew it. God, I can't stand this guy. <laughs> Why, Mike? Why is because it perfect? It's just a great movie. I know that. It, it scares me. It was like a scream 16 years before Scream. Okay, here's why you can't give it a 10. Mike, what's, okay. your, favorite, what's your favorite Friday the 13th? Friday the 13th, part 6. Okay. So how and 3. Okay. So you're saying this is just as good why as... Why, No, Mike, listen. It's like, it's like the hottest girl at work. She's hot for a work... A worker in your job, but well, she's I've never worked with any hot girls. Girl, so. Yeah, no. yeah, but you would never look at you wouldn't look at her for two seconds anywhere else. You know what I mean? Mike, so you have to, to judge give it. Give it a ten, though, Mike. You, it has to really stand out. It has to be very significant. Now, yeah. what sets that movie apart from any other thing besides everything that we mentioned? Because let's face it, those aren't groundbreaking things. They're, They're significant not. in the world of horror, but you know they, they didn't set it over the top. Okay, so yeah, where do you go eight? from that? So you have eight. Okay, I'll, I'll accept your eight. All right. All right, well then I'll give it an eight. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Just for just for effort. Eight for effort. An eight for effort. Exactly. Yeah. All right, well this was the Skeleton Crew at Rabbit and Blue Radio. This was the first episode of uh, the 12 Friday the 13th shows. And we will be back tomorrow for Friday the 13th Part 2. We're looking forward to it. So, signing off, this is Alex. Michael J. And... Dan Chase. Dan Chase. See you tomorrow. Hi, girl. Excuse me. Hi, boy. Hey, you speak English? How far is it to Camp Crystal Lake? <laughs> that far, huh? Okie dokie. See you later. Ugh. Welcome to the Rabbit Blue Radio with the Skeleton Crew, exclusively at Orbit.com. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Rabbit and Blue Radio. Alice, Mike, what do you think the relationship was between Alice and Steve Christie? I mean, the dude looks like a child molester uh, with those with those cut off shorts, glasses, the, the long curly hair, that mustache, and uh, you know, Alice says, "I'm going to go back to California to straighten some things right. out." You know, but she had to live near there, otherwise, how would he have hired her from California? I mean, what do you what do you think the relationship was prior to this movie? Well, I read the the novelization of it, you know, the book, and I don't want to try to get too technical here, but in the book, they kind of, she's known him, I guess, like they've had um, trysts, I guess, like romantic things in the past, and it kind of like expands on the film Crystal Lake, so. Yeah. That's and, different. And you know what? Halloween borrowed from Black Christmas and Psycho, and, and nobody seems to bash that for that, do they? No. no. What do you think, Dan? I mean... Uh, do, do you feel well, Friday 13th is different enough from Halloween where it's its own entity? 
Well, it definitely is, and I think it set out to be that originally. It, it tried to, uh, you know, copy Halloween and what, and what Halloween did right, but it turned into something different. You know, everybody loves the atmosphere, of course. Everybody knows that. You know, the music is amazing. You know, I want to get into, like, the actual movie, though. Steve Christie owns Camp Crystal Lake, and he's reopening it. He invested $25,000 into it. And uh, it starts off, you know, you see him in Yo, with the skeleton crew. This is Alex. Michael J. And our special guest host, Dan Chase. We've, uh, I, I know what you're thinking. Uh, we kind of remember that show. They've been gone for a while. Well, you know, things are a little different. We're a little restructured now. And we're going to get into all that later. But right now, we got a special for you. We are doing the 12 days of Friday the 13th. We're going to break down, dissect, and everything in between all 12 Friday the 13th movies leading up to Friday the 13th. This April, which is the first Friday 13th of the year, and uh, you're going to have a good time. We're all going to have a good time, right, guys? Very excited. I am very excited. I am thrilled. I'm, I'm pitching a 10 over it. But... <laughs> I, I'm ready to puke. Well, obviously, let's just, you know, get a little intro of the movie. Um, basically, Halloween got everything going. Uh, Friday 13th, Sean Cunningham, he saw the popularity of Halloween. Victor uh, Miller decided to write a screenplay basically ripping off Halloween. But you know what? There's enough differences where basically all they did was take the holiday type of theme. Halloween is very subtle and suggestive. And uh, Friday 13th is more like visceral and brutal. So I think I think they're two different movies. What do you think, Mike? I would totally agree with you. I mean, they are, because you got babysitters in Halloween, and these are camp counselors on 